Chapter 3, Part 3 of The Idiot by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Eva M. Martin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Alia Maki. Chapter 3. The occurrence at the Vauxhall had filled both mother and daughters with something like horror. In their excitement, Lizabetha Prokofievna and the girls were nearly running all the way home. In her opinion, there was so much disclosed and laid bare by the episode that, in spite of the chaotic condition of her mind, she was able to feel more or less decided on certain points which up to now had been in a cloudy condition. However, one and all of the party realized that something important had happened, and that perhaps fortunately enough, something which had hitherto been enveloped in the obscurity of guesswork had now begun to come forth a little from the in spite of Prince S.'s assurances and explanations, Evgeny Pavlovich's real character and position were at last coming to light. He was publicly convicted of intimacy with that creature, so thought Lizabetha Prokofievna and her two elder daughters. But the real upshot of the business was that the number of riddles to be solved was augmented. The two girls, though rather irritated at their mother's exaggerated alarm and haste to depart from the scene, had been unwilling to worry her at first with questions. Besides, they could not help thinking that their sister Aglaya probably knew more about the whole matter than both they and their mother put together. Prince S. looked as black as night and was silent and moody. Mrs. Epanchin did not say a word to him all the way home, and he did not seem to observe the fact. Adelaida tried to pump him a little by asking, Who was the uncle they were talking about, and what was it that happened in Petersburg? But he had merely muttered something disconnected about making inquiries, and that, Of course it was all nonsense. Of course, replied Adelaida, and asked no more questions. Aglaya, too, was very quiet, and the only remark she made on the way home was that they were walking much too fast to be pleasant. Once she turned and observed the prince hurrying after them, noticing his anxiety to catch them up, she smiled ironically and looked back no more. At length, just as they entered the house, General Epanchin came out and met them. He had only just arrived from town. His first word was to inquire after Evgeny Pavlovich, but Lizabetha stalked past him and neither looked at him nor answered his question. He immediately judged from the faces of his daughters and Prince S. that there was a thunderstorm brewing, and he himself already bore evidences of unusual perturbation of mind. He immediately buttonholed Prince S. and, standing at the front door, engaged in a whispered conversation with him. But the troubled aspect of both of them, when they entered the house and approached Mrs. Epanchin, it was evident that they had been discussing very disturbing news. Little by little the family gathered together upstairs in Lizabetha Prokofievna's apartments, and Prince Mushkin found himself alone on the veranda when he arrived. He settled himself in a corner and sat waiting, though he knew not what he expected. It never struck him that he had better go away with all these disturbances in the house. He seemed to have forgotten all the world, and to be ready to sit on where he was for years on end. From upstairs he caught sounds of excited conversation every now and then. He could not say how long he sat there. It grew late and became quite dark. Suddenly Aglaya entered the veranda. She seemed to be quite calm, though a little pale. Observing the prince, whom she evidently did not expect to see there alone in the corner, she smiled and approached him. "'What are you doing there?' she asked. The prince muttered something, blushed, and jumped up. But Aglaya immediately sat down beside him, so he reseated himself. She looked suddenly but attentively into his face, then at the window as though thinking of something else, and then again at him. "'Perhaps she wants to laugh at me.' thought the prince but no for if she did she certainly would do so would you like to come to tea i'll order some she said after a minute or two of silence N no thanks i don't know don't know how can you not know by the by look here if someone were to challenge you to a duel what should you do i wish to ask you this some time ago why nobody would ever challenge me to a duel but if they were to would you be dreadfully frightened? 
I dare say I should be much alarmed. Seriously? Then are you a coward? N no, I don't think so. A coward is a man who is afraid and runs away. The man who is frightened but does not run away is not quite a coward, said the prince with a smile after a moment's thought. And you wouldn't run away? No, I don't, I don't think I should run away, replied the prince, laughing outright at last at Aglaya's question. Though I am a woman, I should certainly not run away from anything, said Aglaya in a slightly pained voice. However, I see you are laughing at me and twisting your face up as usual in order to make yourself look more interesting. Now tell me, they generally shoot at twenty paces, don't they? At ten, sometimes? I suppose if at ten they must be either wounded or killed, mustn't they? I don't think they often kill each other at duels. They killed Pushkin that way. That may have been an accident. Not a bit of it. It was a duel to the death and he was killed. The bullet struck so low down that probably his antagonist would never have aimed at that part of him. People never do. He would have aimed at his chest or head, so that probably the bullet hit him accidentally. I have been told this by competent authorities. Well, a soldier once told me that they were always ordered to aim at the middle of the body. So you see, they don't aim at the chest or head, they aim lower on purpose. I asked some officer about this afterwards, and he said it was perfectly true. That is probably when they fire from a long distance. Can you shoot at all? No, I have never shot in my life. Can't you even load a pistol? No. That is, I understand how it's done, of course, but I have never done it. Then you don't know how, for it is a matter that needs practice. Now listen and learn. In the first place, buy good powder, not damp. They say it mustn't be damp at all, but very dry. Some fine kind it is. You must ask for pistol powder, not the stuff they load cannons with. They say one makes the bullet oneself, somehow or other. Have you got a pistol? No, and I don't want one said the prince laughing oh what nonsense you must buy one french or english are the best they say then take a little powder about a thimbleful or perhaps two and pour it into the barrel better put plenty then push in a bit of felt it must be felt for some reason or other you can easily get a bit of some old mattresses or off a door it's used to keep the cold out well when you have pushed the felt down put the bullet in do you hear now the bullet last and the powder first, not the other way or the pistol won't shoot. What are you laughing at? I wish you to buy a pistol and practice every day, and you must learn to hit a mark for certain, will you? The prince only laughed. Aglaya stamped her foot with annoyance. Her serious air, however, during this conversation had surprised him considerably. He had a feeling that he ought to be asking her something, that there was something he wanted to find out far more important than how to load a pistol. But his thoughts had all scattered, and he was only aware that she was sitting by him and talking to him, and that he was looking at her. As to what she happened to be saying to him, that did not matter in the least. The general now appeared on the veranda coming from upstairs. He was on his way out, with an expression of determination on his face, and of preoccupation and worry also. "'Ah, Lef Nikolaevich, is that you, is it? Where are you off to now?' he asked, oblivious of the fact that the prince had not showed the least sign of moving. "'Come along with me, I want to say a word or two to you.' "'Au revoir, then,' said Aglaya, holding out her hand to the prince. It was quite dark now, and Mushkin could not see her face clearly, but a minute or two later, when he and the general had left the villa, he suddenly flushed up and squeezed his right hand tightly. It appeared that he and the general were going in the same direction. In spite of the lateness of the hour, the general was hurrying away to talk to someone upon some important subject. Meanwhile, he talked incessantly but disconnectedly to the prince, and continually brought in the name of Lizabetha Prokofievna. If the prince had been in a condition to pay more attention to what the general was saying, he would have discovered that the latter was desirous of drawing some information out of him, or indeed of asking him some question outright, but that he could not make up his mind to come to the point. 
Mishkin was so absent that from the very first he could not attend to a word the other was saying, and when the general suddenly stopped before him with some excited question, he was obliged to confess ignominiously that he did not know in the least what he had been talking about. The general shrugged his shoulders. How strange everyone, yourself included, has become of late, said he. I was telling you that I cannot in the least understand Lizabetha Prokofievna's ideas and agitations. She is in hysterics up there and moans and says that we have been shamed and disgraced. How? Why? When? By whom? I confess that I am very much to blame myself. I do not conceal the fact, but the conduct, the outrageous behavior of this woman must really be kept within limits by the police if necessary, and I am just on my way now to talk the question over and make some arrangements. It can all be managed quietly and gently, even kindly, without the slightest fuss or scandal. I foresee that the future is pregnant with events, and that there is much that needs explanation." there is intrigue in the wind but if on one side nothing is known on the other side nothing will be explained if i have heard nothing about it nor have you nor he nor she who has heard about it i should like to know how can all this be explained except by the fact that half of its mirage or moonshine or some hallucination of that sort she is insane muttered the prince suddenly recollecting all that had passed with a spasm of pain in his heart I too had that idea, and I slept in peace, but now I see that their opinion is more correct. I do not believe in the theory of madness. The woman has no common sense, but she is not only insane, she is artful to a degree. Her outburst of this evening about Evgeny's uncle proves that conclusively. It was villainous, simply jesuitical. It was all for some special purpose. What about Evgeny's uncle? My goodness, Lev Nikolaevich! Why, you can't have heard a single word I said. Look at me, I'm still trembling all over from dreadful shock. It is that that kept me in town so late. Evgeny Pavlovich's uncle? Well, cried the prince, shot himself this morning at seven o'clock. A respected, eminent old man of seventy, and exactly point for point as she described it, a sum of money, a considerable sum of the government's money, missing. Why, how could she? What know of it? <laughs> Why, there was a whole crowd round her the moment she appeared on the scene here. You know what sort of people surround her nowadays and solicit the honour of her acquaintance. Of course, she might easily have heard the news from someone coming from town. All Petersburg, if not all Pavlovsk, knows it by now. Look at the slyness of her observation about Evgeny's uniform. I mean, her remark that he had retired just in time. There's a venomous hint for you, if you like. No, no, there's no insanity there. Of course I refuse to believe that Evgeny Pavlovich could have known beforehand of the catastrophe, that at such and such day at seven o'clock, and all that. But he might as well have had a presentiment of the truth, and all of us, Prince S. and everybody, believe that he was to inherit a large fortune from his uncle. It's dreadful, horrible. Mind, I don't suspect Evgeny of anything, be quite clear on that point. But the thing is, a little suspicion nevertheless. Prince S. can't get over it. Altogether, it is a very extraordinary combination of circumstances. What suspicion attaches to Evgeny Pavlovich? Oh, none at all. He has behaved very well indeed. I didn't mean to drop any sort of hint. His own fortune is intact, I believe. Lizabetha Prokofievna, of course, refuses to listen to anything. That is the worst of it all, these family catastrophe or quarrels, or whatever you like to call them. You know, Prince, you are a friend of the family, so I don't mind telling you. It now appears that Evgeny Pavlovich proposed to Aglaya a month ago, and was refused. Impossible, cried the prince. Why? Do you know anything about it? Look here, continued the general, more agitated than ever and trembling with excitement. Maybe I have been letting the cat out of the bag too freely with you. If so, it is because you are that sort of man, you know. Perhaps you have some special information? I know nothing about Evgeny Pavlovich, said the prince. Nor do I. They always try to bury me underground when there is something going on. They don't seem to reflect that it is unpleasant to a man to be treated so. I won't stand it. We have just had a terrible scene. Mind, I speak to you as I would to my own son. Aglaya laughs at her mother, her sister's guest about Evgeny having proposed and been rejected, and told Elizabetha. I tell you, my dear fellow, Aglaya is such an extraordinary, such a self-willed, fantastical little creature. 
her. You wouldn't believe it. Every high quality, every brilliant trait of heart and mind are to be found in her, and with it all, so much caprice and mockery. Such wild fantasies, indeed, a little devil! She has just been laughing at her mother to her very face, and at her sisters, and at Prince S, and everybody, and of course she always laughs at me. You know, I love the child. I love her even when she laughs at me, and I believe the little wild creature has special fondness for me for that very reason. She is fonder of me than any of the others. I dare swear she has a good laugh at you before now. You are having a quiet talk, I observed, after all the thunder and lightning upstairs. She was sitting with you just as though there had been no row at all. The prince blushed painfully in the darkness and closed his right hand tightly, but he said nothing. "'My dear good Prince Lev Nikolaevich began the general again. "'Both I and Elizabetha Prokofievna, who has begun to respect you once more, "'and me through you, goodness knows why, "'we both love you very sincerely and esteem you in spite of any appearances to the contrary. "'But you'll admit what a riddle it must have been for us "'when that calm, cold little spitfire Aglaya, "'for she stood up to her mother and answered her questions with inexpressible contempt, "'and mine still more so, because, like a fool, I thought it my duty "'to assert myself as head of the family, when Aglaya stood up of a sudden, and informed us that that mad woman, strangely enough, she used exactly the same expression as you did, has taken it into her head to marry me to Prince Lev Nikolaevich, and therefore is doing her best to choke Evgeny Pavlovich off and rid the house of him. That's what she said. I would not give the slightest explanation. She burst out laughing, banged the door, and went away. We all stood there with our mouths open. Well, I was told afterwards of your little passage to the Aglaya this afternoon, and, and dear prince, you are a good, sensible fellow. Don't be angry if I speak out. She is laughing at you, my boy. She is enjoying herself like a child at your expense, and therefore, since she is a child, don't be angry with her, and don't think anything of it. I assure you, she is simply making a fool of you, just as she does with one and all of us, out of pure lack for something better to do. Well, goodbye. You know our feelings, don't you? Our sincere feelings for you. They are unalterable. You must know, dear boy, under all circumstances, but, well, here we part. I must go down to the right. Rarely have I sat so uncomfortably in my saddle, as they say, as I now sit. And people talk of the charms of a country holiday. Left to himself at the crossroad, the prince glanced around him, quickly crossed the road towards the lighted windows of the neighboring house, and unfolded a tiny scrap of paper, which he had clasped in his right hand during the whole of his conversation with the general. He read the note in the uncertain rays that fell from the window. It was as follows. Tomorrow morning I shall be at the green bench in the park at seven, and shall wait there for you. I have made up my mind to speak to you about a most important matter which closely concerns yourself. P.S. I trust that you will not show this note to anyone. Though I am ashamed of giving you such instructions, I feel that I must do so, considering what you are. I therefore write the words and blush for your simple character. P.P.S. It is the same green bench that I showed you before. There, aren't you ashamed of yourself? I felt that it was necessary to repeat even that information. The note was written and folded anyhow, evidently in great hurry, and probably just before Aglai had come down to the veranda. In inexpressible agitation amounting almost to fear, the prince slipped quickly away from the window, away from the light, like a frightened thief. But as he did so, he collided violently with some gentleman who seemed to spring from the earth at his feet. "'I was watching for you, prince,' said the individual. "'Is that you, Kala? said the prince in surprise. "'Yes, I have been looking for you. "'I waited for you at the Apanchin's house, but of course I could not come in. "'I dogged you from behind as you walked along the general. "'Well, prince, here is Keller, absolutely at your service. "'Command him, ready to sacrifice himself, even to die in case of need. "'But why?' "'Oh, why? Of course you'll be challenged. "'There was young Lieutenant Moloftsov. I know him, or rather of him. He won't pass an insult. He will take no notice of Rogozhin and myself, and therefore you are the only one left to account for. You'll have to pay the piper, Prince. He has been asking about you, and undoubtedly his friend will call on you tomorrow. Perhaps he is at your house already. If you would do me the honor to have me for a second, Prince, I should be happy. That's why I have been looking for you now. Duel! You've come to talk about a duel, too? The prince burst out laughing to the great astonishment of Keller. He laughed unrestrainedly. 
and keller who had been on pins and needles and in a fever of excitement to offer himself as second was very near being offended you caught him by the arms you know prince no man of proper pride can stand that sort of treatment in public yes and he gave me a fearful dig in the chest cried the prince still laughing what are we to fight about i shall beg his pardon that's all but if we must fight we'll fight let him have a shot at me by all means i should rather like it <laughs> i know how to load a pistol now do you know how to load a pistol keller first you have to buy the powder you know it mustn't be wet and mustn't be that coarse stuff that they load cannons with it must be a pistol powder then you pour the powder in and get hold of a bit of felt from some door then shove the bullet in but don't shove the bullet in before the powder because the thing wouldn't go off do you hear keller the thing wouldn't go off <laughs> isn't that a grand reason keller my friend eh do you know my dear fellow i really must kiss you and embrace you this very moment <laughs> How was it that you so suddenly popped up in front of me as you did? Come to my house as soon as you can, and we'll have some champagne. We'll all get drunk. Do you know I have a dozen champagne in Lebedev's cellar? Lebedev sold them to me the day after I arrived. I took the lot. We'll invite everybody. Are you going to do any sleep tonight? As much as usual, prince. Why? Pleasant dreams, then. <laughs> the prince crossed the road and disappeared into the park leaving the astonished keller in a state of ludicrous wonder he had never before seen the prince in such a strange condition of mind and could not have imagined the possibility of it fever probably he said to himself for the man is all nerves and this business has been a little too much for him he is not afraid that's clear that sort never funks hmm champagne that was an interesting item of news at all events twelve bottles dear me that's a very respectable little stock indeed i bet anything lebedeff lent somebody money on deposit of his dozen of champagne hm he's a nice fellow is this prince i like this sort of man well i needn't be wasting time here if it's a case of champagne why there's no time like the present that the prince was almost in fever was no more the truth he wandered about the park for a long while and at last came to himself in a lonely avenue he was vaguely conscious that he had already paced this particular walk from the large dark tree to the bench at the other end about a hundred yards altogether at least thirty times backwards and forwards as to recollecting what he had been thinking of all that time he could not he caught himself however indulging in one thought which made him roar with laughter though there was nothing really to laugh at in it he felt that he must laugh and go on laughing it struck him that the idea of a duel might not have occurred to keller alone but that his lesson in the art of pistol loading might not have been altogether accidental Pooh! nonsense he said to himself struck by another thought of a sudden why she was immensely surprised to find me there on the veranda and laughed and talked about tea and yet she had this little note in her hand therefore she must have known that i was waiting there so why was she surprised <laughs> he pulled the note out and kissed it then paused and reflected how strange it all is how strange he muttered melancholy enough now in moments of great joy he invariably felt the sensation of melancholy come over him he could not tell why he looked intently around him and wondered why he had come here he was very tired so he approached the bench and sat down on it around him was profound silence the music in the vox hall was over the park seemed quite empty though it was not in reality later than half past eleven it was a quiet warm clear night a real petersburg night of early june but in the dense avenue where he was sitting it was almost pitch dark if anyone had come up at this moment and told him that he was in love passionately in love he would have rejected the idea with astonishment and perhaps with irritation and if anyone had added that aglaya's note was a love letter and that it contained an appointment to a lover's rendezvous he would have blushed with shame for the speaker and probably have challenged him to a duel all oh, this would have been perfectly sincere on his part he had never for a moment entertained the idea of the possibility of this girl loving him or even of such a thing as himself falling in love with her the possibility of being loved himself a man like me as he put it he ranked among ridiculous suppositions it appeared to him that it was simply a joke on aglaya's part if there really were anything in it at all 
but that seemed to him quite natural his preoccupation was caused by something different as to the few words which the general had let slip about aglaya laughing at everybody and at himself most of all he entirely believed them he did not feel the slightest sensation of offence on the contrary he was quite certain that it was as it should be his whole thoughts were now as to the next early morning he would sit by her on that little green bench and listen to how pistols were loaded and look at her he wanted nothing more the question as to what she might have to say of special interest to himself occurred to him once or twice he did not doubt for a moment that she really had some such subject of conversation in store but so very little interested in the matter was he that it did not strike him to wonder what it could be the crunch of gravel on the path suddenly caused him to raise his head a man whose face it was difficult to see in the gloom approached the bench and sat down beside him the prince peered into his face and recognized the livid features of rogozhin i knew you'd be wandering about somewhere here i didn't have to look for you very long muttered the latter between his teeth it was the first time that they had met since the encounter on the staircase at the hotel painfully surprised as he was at the sudden apparition of rogozhin the prince for some little while was unable to collect his thoughts rogozhin evidently saw and understood the impression he had made and though he seemed more or less confused at first yet he began talking with what looked like assumed ease and freedom however the prince soon changed his mind on this score and thought that there was not only no affectation of indifference but that rogozhin was not even particularly agitated if there were a little apparent awkwardness it was only in his words and gestures the man could not change his heart how did you find me here asked the prince for the sake of saying something keller told me i found him at your place that you were in the park of course he is i thought why so asked the prince uneasily rogozhin smiled but did not explain i received your letter lef nikolaevitch what's the good of it all it's no use you know i come to you from her she bade me tell you that she must see you she has something to say to you she told me to find you to-day i'll come to-morrow now i'm going home are you coming to my house why should i i've given you the message good-bye won't you come asked the prince in a gentle voice what extraordinary man you are i wonder at you rogozhin laughed sarcastically why do you hate me so asked the prince sadly you know yourself that all you suspected is quite unfounded i felt you were still angry with me though do you know why because you tried to kill me that's why you can't shake off your wrath against me i tell you that i only remember parfen rogozhin with whom i exchanged crosses and vowed brotherhood i wrote you this in yesterday's letter in order that you might forget all that madness on your part and that you might not feel called to talk about it when we met why do you avoid me why do you hold your hand back from me i tell you again i consider all that has passed a delirium an insane dream i can understand all you did and all you felt that day as if it were myself what you were in imagining was not the case and could never be the case why then should there be any anger between us you don't know what anger is <laughs> laughed rogozhin in reply to the prince's heated words he had moved a pace or two away and was hiding his hands behind him no it is impossible for me to come to your house again he added slowly why why do you hate me so much as all that i don't love you lef nikolaevitch and therefore what would be the use of my coming to see you you are just like a child you want a plaything and it must be taken out and given you and then you don't know how to work it you are simply repeating all you said in your letter and what's the use of course i believe every word you say i know perfectly well that you neither did or ever can deceive me in any way and yet i don't love you you write that you've forgotten everything and only can remember your brother parfen with whom you exchanged crosses and that you don't remember anything about the rogozhin who aimed a knife at your throat what do you know about my feelings eh rogozhin laughed disagreeably here you are holding out your brotherly forgiveness to me for a thing that i have perhaps never repented of in the slightest degree i did not think of it again all that evening all my thoughts were centred on something else 
not think of it again of course you did cried the prince and i dare swear that you came straight away down here to pavlov's to listen to the music and dog her about in the crowd and stare at her just as you did to-day there's nothing surprising in that if you hadn't been in that condition of mind that you could think of nothing but one subject you would probably have never raised your knife against me i had a presentiment of what you would do that day ever since i saw you first in the morning do you know yourself what you looked like i knew you would try to murder me even at the very moment when we exchanged crosses what did you take me to your mother for did you think to stay your hand by doing so perhaps you did not put your thoughts into words but you and i were thinking the same thing or feeling the same thing looming over us at the same moment what should you think of me now if you had not raised your knife to me the knife which god averted from my throat i would have been guilty of suspecting you all the same and you would have intended the murder all the same therefore we should have been mutually guilty in any case come don't frown you needn't laugh at me either you say you haven't repented repented you probably couldn't if you were to try you dislike me too much for that why if i were an angel of light and as innocent before you as a babe you would still loathe me if you believed that she loved me instead of loving yourself that's jealousy that's the real jealousy but do you know what i have been thinking out during this last week parfum i'll tell you what if she loves you now better than anyone what if she torments you because she loves you and in proportions to her love for you so she torments you the more she won't tell you this of course you must have eyes to see why do you suppose she consents to marry you she must have a reason and that reason she will tell you some day some women desire the kind of love you give her and she is probably one of these your love and your wild nature impress her do you know that a woman is capable of driving a man crazy almost with her cruelties and mockeries and feels not one single pang of regret because she looks at him and says to herself there i'll torment this man nearly into his grave and then oh how i'll compensate him for it all with my love rogozhin listened to the end and then burst out laughing why prince i declare you must have had a taste of this sort of thing yourself haven't you i have heard of something of the kind you know is it true what what can you have heard said the prince stammering rogozhin continued to laugh loudly he had listened to the prince's speech with curiosity and some satisfaction the speaker's impulsive warmth had surprised and even comforted him why i have not only heard of it i see it for myself he said when have you ever spoken like that before it wasn't like yourself prince why if i hadn't heard this report about you i should never have come all this way into the parks at midnight too i don't understand you in the least parfin oh she told me about it long ago and tonight i saw for myself i saw you at the music you know and whom you were sitting with she swore to me yesterday and again today that you were madly in love with aglaya ivanovna but that's all the same to me prince and it's not my affair at all for if you have ever ceased to love her she has not ceased to love you you know of course she wants to marry you to that girl she's sworn to it <laughs> she says to me until then i won't marry you when they go to church we'll go too and not before what on earth does she mean by it i don't know i never did either she loves you without limits or yet if she loves you why does she wish to marry you to another girl she says i want to see him happy which is to say she loves you i wrote and i say to you once more that she is not in her right mind said the prince who had listened with anguish to what rogozhin said goodness no you may be wrong there at all events she named the day this evening as we left the gardens in three weeks says she and perhaps sooner we shall be married she swore to it took off her cross and kissed it so it all depends upon you now prince you see <laughs> that is all madness what you say about me parfum never can and never will be to-morrow i shall come and see you how can she be mad rogozhin interrupted when she is sane enough for other people and only mad for you how can she write letters to her if she is mad if she were insane they would observe it in her letters what letters said the prince alarmed she writes to her and the girl reads the letters haven't you heard you are sure to hear she's sure to show you the letters herself i won't believe this cried the prince 
why prince you've only gone a few steps along this road i perceive you're evidently a mere beginner wait a bit before long you'll have your own detectives you watch day and night and you'll know every little thing that goes on there that is if drop that subject rogozhin and never mention it again and listen as i have sat here and talked and listened it had suddenly struck me that to-morrow is my birthday it must be about twelve o'clock now come home with me do and we'll see the day in we'll have some wine and you shall wish me i don't know what but you especially you must wish me a good wish and i shall wish you a full happiness in return otherwise hand me my cross back you didn't return it to me the next day haven't you got it on now yes i have said rogozhin come along then i don't wish to meet my new year without you my new life i should say for a new life is beginning for me do you know parfin that a new life had begun for me i see for myself that it is so then i shall tell her but you are not quite yourself Lav nikolaevitch end of chapter three part three